Take a look at this. How does it make you feel? Do you get a tingle in your fingers, a lump at the back of your throat, your hair slowly rising off of your skin? What you're experiencing right now is the fear of the uncanny valley. It's an evolutionary warning system that has helped us distinguish between friend and foe for 300,000 years. Unfortunately, with the insane rise of artificial intelligence, we are on the edge of an evolutionary shift that could erase this defense mechanism completely and put our species in grave danger. Is there anything we can do about this? And if not, what does the future hold for humanity in a world where it's impossible to distinguish between what's human and what's not? Uh, but before we get there, what exactly is the Uncanny Valley? Well, to answer that, we have to go back to the year 1970. In 1970, Japanese roboticist Masahiro Mori stumbled on something strange. Uh, people liked robots that were obviously machines. Metal arms, mechanical faces, things like that. But when the robots were more humanoid, people's reactions shifted. The closer the robots looked to humans, the more unsettling they became. At first, this was baffling. Humans see faces in clouds, cars, even furniture. We love projecting humanity onto non-human objects. So, why did lifelike robots disturb us instead of comforting us? Mori studied this surprising phenomenon using many different objects, from things that bear no resemblance to humans all the way to an actual human being. And from his findings, he was able to draw what would become one of the most haunting graphs in robotics, one that he coined the Uncanny Valley. On the y-axis is Shinwakan what Mori called familiarity or likability. Picture uh, C-3PO from Star Wars, polite, refined, but unmistakably a machine. On the x-axis is human likeness, how much something feels like one of us. Once you move past the midpoint, the curve suddenly plunges. That's the valley. It's where charm gives way to unease. A robot that was once Superman 4 cute becomes iRobot creepy. No amount of Alan Tudyk can soften that empty, almost human stare. But why do we have these eerie feelings towards things that appear human but aren't human enough? This message is sponsored by Raycon. Before we continue, Making these videos usually means I spend way too much time staring at a computer screen, and I know that isn't good for my health. So I've been trying to get a lot more physical activity into my day recently, but sometimes finding the motivation can be difficult. So what I started doing is listening to my favorite podcasts while I'm at the gym or I'm taking a walk. The only way I was able to do this is by using the essential open earbuds from Raycon. They have honestly become my favorite everyday earbuds. They're ultra light, super comfortable, and they come with a flexible ear hook that rotates to fit your ears perfectly. So they stay secure no matter what I'm doing. <laughs> they get so comfortable that I sometimes forget they're in my ears for hours. The best part about these earbuds is the price. You're getting the same premium audio quality as the big brands for half the price. And in fact, because it's currently Raycon's anniversary, the essential open earbuds are 30% off, which basically makes them a steal. And you don't have to take my word for it. With over 3 million satisfied customers and a 30-day happiness guarantee, you really can't go wrong with these. The earbuds feature multi-point connections, so they're always connected to both my phone and laptop, and they switch automatically depending on the audio source. You also get around 8 hours on a single charge, with an additional 24 hours in the charging case. I use these earbuds, and you should too. So if you want to support the channel and upgrade your everyday listening, click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash apertureytopen to get 30% off the essential open earbuds. Well, there are many theories that have been proposed as to why we experience the uncanny valley, one of which blames the existence of Neanderthals, our ancient rival species. Some people argue that humans developed advanced facial pattern recognition as a way to differentiate between the species. This argument, I'll be honest, it sounds okay on the surface, but it quickly falls apart once you look at the available evidence. First, we have DNA evidence that proves that at least some of our human ancestors and Neanderthals were interbreeding. 
quite a lot, actually. In fact, a lot of humans that are alive today have a tiny slice of Neanderthal DNA within them, so I don't necessarily know if it makes sense for us to develop a fear of the things that we were happily getting into bed with. There's also the fact that there are a lot of human groups that never had an interaction with Neanderthals, yet those humans today still experience the uncanny valley. So why would they evolve something for a threat that didn't exist for them? Another theory, one that I personally believe makes a lot more sense, is that the uncanny valley serves as a deterrent from humans like us and not some other species, but just humans who are either sick or lifeless. Although this isn't supported by any hard evidence, it just makes logical sense to me. Think about it. Before modern medicine, ancient humans were likely living side by side with the sick and even the dead, spreading disease and dying in huge numbers. So it makes sense that we evolved a kind of built-in warning system to deter us from other humans who are sick or dead. A pale face, a rigid body, a vacant stare. We evolved to see those cues as signals for danger long before we understood what germs and communicable diseases even were. By avoiding what looked sick or lifeless, we unconsciously protected ourselves. When you think of it like this, the uncanny valley does start to make sense. Look at these pictures again. What do you notice? They all have pale faces, rigid bodies, vacant stare, or even empty eyes. And you can see this expressed in ancient cultures from all over the world that never interacted with one another. Almost every ancient civilization has myths about the undead and zombies. Basically, people that are alive, but look like they're not. These figures embody that primal fear of sickness and decay. You can see the same empty eyes, the stiff movements, the uncanny resemblance to the living, but not quite. It's no coincidence that modern horror films borrow the same imagery. Zombies, ghosts, and uncanny human-like monsters terrify us because they tap into that ancient alarm system. Hollywood may dress it up with makeup and special effects, but underneath, it's the same instinct that told our ancestors, stay away or you might not survive. Today, everyone's experience with the uncanny valley varies. Some people are desensitized from constant exposure to its unnerving effects. You might not be able to stand the sight of a Chucky doll, but your neighbor's collection could look something like this. Many are even born feeling it to a greater or lesser degree than average. We have no universally agreed metric to measure that innate dread, but experts are sure that most people do feel it. The Uncanny Valley has protected us for hundreds of thousands of years from things that could have been a lot more dangerous to us otherwise. It has protected us literally from death and decay. But what happens when it simply doesn't work anymore? When the dangers around us are so good at pretending to be human that it has completely bypassed our evolutionary defense mechanism? When can we no longer tell what is human versus what isn't? Uh, here's the now infamous Will Smith eating spaghetti meme. <laughs> There's a charm to old AI. <laughs> this is the 2025 version. It's by no means a perfect depiction of the actor, but for two years worth of progress, this is a pretty big leap. And that makes you wonder, what could it look like a decade from now? If this text suddenly became indistinguishable from a regular person, how do we cope? Right now on the internet, there's a non-zero chance that you've consumed and actually enjoyed content that was 100% generated by AI. I'm talking about AI-generated faces, voices, scripts, everything. And on the surface, they look human. They smile, stutter when they speak, blink, 
blush when they laugh, our brains, once finely tuned to detect slight changes in our appearance and mannerisms, are now being tested by machines that can mimic us almost perfectly. If we lose that instinct, if our brains can no longer tell the difference between what's human and what's manufactured, then that door is wide open. Misinformation can spread unchecked, trust collapses, anyone could be framed, anyone could be silenced, anyone could have their own reality completely rewritten. It's a frightening possibility, an evolutionary safeguard honed across millennia quietly going extinct in a single generation, leaving us defenseless against lies more powerful than we've ever faced. People can't trust themselves to determine what is real and what isn't anymore. Imagine a world where every voice, every face, every story can be fabricated with perfect precision. When lies are indistinguishable from truth, reality itself becomes negotiable. Who decides what's real when evidence can be forged and even memory can be altered? This is where the uncanny valley transforms from an evolutionary quirk into a philosophical abyss. It forces us to confront questions that we have been dodging for centuries. What makes us human? And what does it mean to trust? And if we can no longer rely on our own perception, then where does truth live? if it does at all. The Uncanny Valley has never been just about faces or robots, it was about survival, about knowing deep down what was safe and what wasn't. But if that instinct fades, we are left exposed. Not to predators in the dark or to sickness in our tribes, but to something quieter. Stories, images, voices, things that feel real enough to believe. And once we start doubting our own perception, it isn't just trust in others that erodes, it's trust in ourselves. All we can do is hope that with time we develop even sharper senses to be able to tell when something isn't quite right. After all, early telephone calls were seen as a ghost in the wire, but now that sounds silly at best. As we raise a generation of children on AI and robots with human likenesses, maybe they grow up with an even sharper sense to be able to distinguish fact from fiction. We can only hope, because the alternative is despair. If we remain on the current trajectory, humanity will end up in a really dark place. In fact, we're already seeing a lot of the dangers of human-like chatbots. OpenAI are currently facing a high-profile lawsuit claiming that ChatGBT encouraged a teen to commit suicide. The boy told ChatGBT of his plans and the chatbot encouraged him to keep it a secret and to not tell anyone while also giving him actionable steps to plot his own demise. And that's just text-based AI that many can admit isn't even that smart, but it's smart enough to maintain the illusion of competence that can drive real people towards terrifying ends. Imagine adding an indistinguishable human face and voice to it, and that effect multiplies in scale. As robotic human likenesses reach new milestones, the illusion will deeply affect interpersonal relationships moving forward, and it's not a question of if, but when. The 2014 film Ex Machina addresses this tastefully. Uh, spoiler warning. In the movie, a billionaire selects an unaware employee for an experiment. He creates a female robot companion based on the employee's data, personality, and romantic preferences. Then he invites the young man to live with him. Over the course of a few days, the man starts to fall in love with this robot. She's influential, her expressions feel real. Her words don't betray the look in her eyes. By all perceptible accounts, this was a blossoming romance. That's what makes it so chilling though, her gaze, her voice, and her trustworthiness. Convincing enough to fool a brilliant mind completely. Once that valley is gone, all that's left is deception. Ex Machina's take on crossing the valley is extremely relevant today. Most stories tend to portray robots valiantly defying their programming for love. However, that's 
not how it realistically works. If a robot is programmed for self-preservation and survival, it has a plethora of ways to achieve that goal. It could play nice and gain the trust of people around it. It could also strategically eliminate threats. There is no appeal to consciousness or a shared history like you'd get with fellow humans. When something looks human but pursues inhuman goals, it can lead to some terrifying consequences. Picture this. An AI is programmed to make as many paper clips as possible. Dedicated to this goal, it converts all matter in the universe into paper clips for maximum efficiency. As wild as it sounds, the AI is only doing its job effectively. The Uncanny Valley evolved as a kind of firewall, one primed to warn us when something looks like a healthy human but isn't. If technology can successfully smoothen that valley out, it would be a great loss for one of our strongest evolutionary filters. Perhaps achieving accurate human likeness from robots isn't the progress we are encouraged to cheer for. In reality, it might be the destruction of our final defense against danger. How can we adapt? Now, there is one side of this debate that offers a unique perspective. What would a future without the Uncanny Valley look like? If robots are able to mimic the full spectrum of emotions convincingly, well, we will need to make some tough choices. That human likeness will probably spur an unexpected reaction, one that protects and even grants certain human rights to machines. Without these laws, we would be shooting ourselves in the foot. What kind of world would we be living in otherwise? When certain humans are willing to hurt and break human-like robots, would we be comfortable? Well, that's highly unlikely. Uh, spiritually, there are perspectives that acknowledge a, a higher ascension, even for robots. According to Masahiro Mori, robots possess the potential for enlightenment or Buddhahood. He envisioned a future where humans and robots could coexist peacefully, arguing that transcending worldly desires was a worthwhile objective for both. There's no guarantee on what the right direction will be. So we must ask ourselves, are we ascending to a new plane of coexistence or are we walking blindly into the most perfect trap ever devised? One that we're intentionally designing to be impossible to spot by our own natural senses. I hope for the sake of us all that it's the former. Thank you.